My name is Khalid Kosser. I'm the executive director of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, uh, which is the global fund focusing on preventing violent extremism, which I think is one of the topics we may be discussing over the next uh, 45 minutes uh, or so. We have a wonderful Prezi designed for us by the experts from Prezi, so we're very grateful indeed. This was the uh, advertised uh, panel that we put before you. Uh, the Horn of Africa faces obstacles to security and development in the form of terrorism, climate change, and governance. At a time when Africa is attracting interest for long-term investment and international cooperation, how can leaders capture the opportunities to move the region forward? We were scheduled to have three panelists, uh, including the head of Save the Children, Hela, but unfortunately you'll have seen about the terrible attack on the Save the Children offices in Jalalabad in Afghanistan today, and so she's had to go back to deal with that crisis and of course sends her apologies and our, our thoughts with her and her team in these very difficult uh, moments. We are very honoured indeed to have two really stellar speakers on this topic. First, the Prime Minister of Somalia. Thank you very much indeed, Prime Minister, for joining us. I'm pleased you made it through the snow eventually uh, and got here. Secondly, the leader, the head of UNDP, recently appointed Akim Steiner. It's very nice to see you again, uh, Akim. I've encouraged the speakers to try to fit what I think is Professor Schwab's and, and the World Economic Forum's agenda around these issues, which is firstly to try to take a long-term perspective. We're working towards a, a vision of 2030. Secondly, to try to focus on opportunities as well as challenges. And I think there are great opportunities in Somalia and around the Horn of Africa. Let's focus on the positive. Let's see what lessons we can learn from the past. Let's see how we can make things better in the future. And the other thing I did invite the panelists to think about, and we'll have a discussion with them and with you, is what the people gathered here in Davos this week can do to help. This is a platform, it's a platform for action. So let's see what can be done with the private sector, with the multi-stakeholder uh, platform that, that the World Economic Forum provides in order to really take forward some of the ideas that I think we're going to hear uh, from the Prime Minister and from Akim Steiner. Last couple of slides before we go forward. This is the area that we are talking about, traditionally defined as the Horn of Africa, as you can see Somalia, and there'll be of course a focus on Somalia by the Prime Minister, also including Eritrea, uh, Djibouti and Ethiopia. And I think Akim is going to speak about the wider context and not just uh, Somalia. And for some geographers at least, the extended Horn of Africa might also include Sudan, South Sudan and Uganda as well. So this is the region that we are considering, but I think most of the focus for our discussion this, uh, this evening will be uh, on uh, Somalia. So we'll hear from the two panellists. There's then a few presentation slides on refugees, and I'd like to say a few words about refugee flows both out of Somalia, and I think more promisingly back into Somalia, and then open it to you colleagues for questions, for discussion, for your ideas on how to take forward the real opportunities of this very exciting part of the world. So without further ado, Prime Minister, welcome, and over to you, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Ali. Thank you. Um, we're very grateful for the World Economic to organize these events because it gives us an opportunity to look into to the world uh, and uh, to look inward so that we can formulate new policies and new strategies. Uh, Somalia is a nation that the world has been for many years. But we believe now, after 27 years, things are different. But I want to take you back to talk about a minute or two what Somalia used to be. For many people who talk now about Somalia or write or read about Somalia, they see terrorism, mm -hmm. they see insecurity, they see refugees, and they see tragic incidents. If you go back in history and see what the nation was from the 1950s. From independence in the 1960s, Somalia was the first democrats of Africa, the first country in Africa that had a peaceful transition of power, multi-party systems. That's from 1960 to 1968. I'm not sure if you've heard that before. <laughs> no. That is who we are as a nation. It took 25 years for the next African country mm -hmm. to achieve what we've achieved. Tragically today, we seem to be a nation that is inflicting harm in, in our continent. After many years now, Somalia has a great opportunity. We still have challenges in terms of insecurity, challenges of resources in terms of 
uh, actual liquidity and cash. But today where we are, we have a number of potentials that I'm going to draw into the attention for those of you who are in the audience and those of us joining us from somewhere else. One, uh, the nation have had a powerful transition of power, democratically elected president. Mm. And when the power was being given or uh, you had two former presidents, the one who was defeated, the previous one, and the current president. It was a display of Somali institutions working. Mm -hmm. Second, you have institutions that are working. Uh, for the first time now, we have a major legislation that has been adopted. And it is not simply to build institutions. The background of it is to attract uh, investors into the country. And I will talk about reasoning why. These include uh, financial law, anti-corruption law, telecommunication is law. Uh, 10 or 15 different laws that will cater for long-term stability uh, in the country. Those will also give uh, the international partners who would want to partner with us a sense of feeling that this nation now uh, is moving forward. Second, we're working on what we call a complete overhaul of our political systems. We are now initiating a multi-party system uh, where political parties now in 2020 uh, will be taking part of a future and um, potential election. We are concluding uh, the political party laws, the electoral model, electoral system. We are concluding the process of uh, bringing a constitution that is agreed to all Somalis, uh, which in reality means that come 2020, the nation would, would be uh, in a different position. On security, we're gearing toward a process where the security forces of our country will in the future take over from Amazon. Uh, so we are in a transition process where we are training, equipping, uh, our security forces. Uh, in terms of accountability, uh, as you've seen that we're working with international financial institutions for the first time in many years, you would have institutions like the IMF and the World Bank that are saying they welcome the government's strong commitment into political and economic reforms, which means that we are looking forward to work with them so that we can uh, eradicate the burden of a debt that the previous systems over 30 years have uh, inflicted the nation. Now, we're doing this simply because we finally came to the conclusion that the only way we can move forward our nation is for us to formulate our solutions. Second, we came to the conclusion that no matter how many international outfits give you legitimacy, the only legitimacy that can help you govern and move your nation forward is the one that is from within. Mm -hmm. We are a nation where it is uh, population are 75% uh, people under the age of 30 years. That is the biggest resources a nation can have. Yet that is also the biggest risk a nation can have if these, the youth haven't, ha are not given the, the opportunities they have in terms of, of of education and opportunity to have a work. So a country that is less than 15 million people, geographically big nation, has the second longest coastline in Africa and located along the second busiest international trade route in the world where trade amounting to trillions dollars transit through its waters. A nation that has a potential of oil, gas, minerals, a nation has one of the vast agricultural land uh, in, in the continent, a nation that has people from all over the world who have uh, left their country but educated uh, outside Somalia who are uh, willing uh, to come back, a nation who has gone through so much that the day the nation moves forward, it is only one way forward because we've seen the past. And if you see now the drawing you see, 
It is the only nation where you would have a lot of Somalis in Kenya, a lot of Somalis in Ethiopia, a lot of Somalis in Djibouti, and across the continent. The challenges you see as a nation, the agony we've gone through as a nation, has, after a number of decades now, uh, came back to us and it presents uh, a major opportunity for us to move forward. We want, therefore, the world to see Somalia, what it is now and the potential it has, what it used to be, and not the middle of period, where Somalia has captured the eyes of the world. And we also don't want to be beholden of that uh, memory. Uh, so uh, as a prime minister uh, in, our, in our country for, uh, for a year now, uh, it is my uh, conviction and a, a complete uh, commitment and understanding that uh, we think this country has the best opportunity today. And we would want the international community and private sectors uh, to, na to take now that opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, because in five years, it is going to be too late. That's right. it is go in 10 years, it is going to be impossible. So w I don't want people to see Somalia, a nation who is looking for handouts. No, we think we are a very rich, resourceful nation, and we're looking for partners. And we are going to be good partners for those who are willing to come and work with us and invest in our country. Prime Minister, thank you so very much for those insights. The life of being a Prime Minister in, in Somalia. You provided us, I think, a very valuable historical corrective that this is a, a recent challenge that, that Somalia has, has faced and a, a very strong uh, and positive history. Uh, you you recognise, I think, some of the challenges. You spoke about the youth bulge, for example, uh, resources, so on and so forth. But I think most importantly, and thank you for doing this, you spoke about the potential. You spoke about democracy, uh, legal system, security, institutional integrity that I think is very important, accountability, legitimacy, all of these things that we know are absolutely fundamental for states like Somalia and others to really develop quickly and positively. If I could, before we hand over to, to Akim, you're here this week, Prime Minister at the World Economic Forum. You're clearly interested, interested, as you said, to begin to attract more private investment, more partnership. Have you had conversations yet with the private sector? Is there, is there growing interest in investing in Somalia? No, I have. I've had. Uh, uh, um, the, the attention and the interest that uh, we are now receiving is, 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 an op is given us for us to be hopeful and optimist. And of course, what we've achieved so far gives us hope and opportunity of, of what we can and must achieve uh, in the future. Um, the, the private sector individuals or companies I've talked to so far, they say, oh, we didn't knew that is the case because this is the first time you would see a Somali leader at the World Economic Forum mm -hmm. or in other forums. What we do now uh, is that we go out and talk to the rest of the world and present our country as a country with huge potentials, as a country which is not belong to the past but belongs to the future, as a country of which those who are willing now to generate resources for themselves and looking for a destination, uh, we would give them a description. And we will also ensure that we make the environment conducive uh, for our people, uh, but also uh, for, for the rest of the world. We live in an in, in a connected world. Uh, we know that because our people have also lived outside of Somalia for many years. I am one of them. And for that, uh, we are a, a big nation uh, in terms of size and land uh, and resources, but a small nation, nation is still in terms of, of, of population. That is why we think rebuilding Somalia uh, is important to, for us to understand the reality that we need to let other people in. Uh, we also are a nation who I think would benefit of diversity, and that is why uh, we are attracting people from abroad to come and join us. Thank you, Prime Minister. And we're delighted that the World Economic Forum has recognised the potential of this country and give you the platform and the opportunity to begin to, to really make this positive narrative and, and attract partnership, as you said. Akin Stani, you run the UN Development Programme. The Prime Minister doesn't want handouts, he wants partnerships. Tell us a bit, if you could, about, about your work, about your, your plans for Somalia and, and, the wider, and the wider horn as well, please. If you have a microphone, you do. Okay. 
<laughs> There's a handheld with it. <clears throat> A great pleasure to be here with the Prime Minister and, and to also, in Davos, try and turn the conversation from one that uh, looks at the region to actually understand with the region what is happening. And I think I want to pick on the title of our session, Strategic Geography, the Horn of Africa. Now, it would be natural at a World Economic Forum to look at that region from a global perspective. And to me, very striking is if somebody were to describe the Horn of Africa today in a global meeting, be it a development, a finance, a geopolitical or security meeting and conference, you know, the terms insecurity, conflict, terrorism, um, you know, uh, prevention of violent extremism would very often be the vocabulary that is used. Yet you, Prime Minister, didn't, except for one or two references, use those terms once. You talked about development, about opportunity, about investment, about trying to build institutions, the, the democratic process the legislative and regulatory frameworks that allow a nation to, to envisage its future. And I think therein lies one of the difficulties for you at the moment as the leader in a nation that is trying to reset the perception, first of all, but also to reset the, the development path of, of Somalia itself. And let me here zoom out for a moment, not just to focus on Somalia, but if you take the region as a whole, strategic geography could also refer to the fact that in a relatively small region, there are many different factors playing out. The fact that the world looks at the Horn of Africa from a strategic perspective has a lot to do with the trade and securing the trade. Piracy was, in a sense, the most uh, egregious uh, trigger of, of that. But as you said, I mean, there is billions of dollars of trade that pass within a few miles of your coastline uh, every day. The region as a whole became also in a period um, following 9-11 and Afghanistan, sort of the next fear factor mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, if a war against terrorism is fought in Afghanistan, what would be the next country uh, that might be <coughs> a likely harbor to such uh, a movement of extremists? So the entire relationship of the international community has been defined in the context of Somalia, but also, um, you know, with conflicts in the region, the, um, you know, independence of South Sudan didn't happen overnight. I mean, it was decades. Ethiopia's intervention in the region mm -hmm. and, and the regional geography. So one of the things I think we, we have to recognize is that in some ways developments locally have also shaped for unfortunately a very long time the perception externally of the region. So yours is a, an extraordinarily challenging uh, uphill task, and yet it also speaks to something that we in the international community, and I use that in the larger sense of the word now, but also in the United Nations system, are trying to become more honest and realistic about. And that is the, the fact that when we talk in the UN, for instance, about the humanitarian, the development, and the peacekeeping and security dimensions of our work, Traditionally, and for political reasons, as much as operational reasons, these are three domains that almost operate in parallel universes of mandate, but also of organizational focus, of funding, of budgets. So the first challenge is that you are a prime minister, you are a government in Somalia, you're trying to invest in the economy, but you're actually dealing with an international community that will look at you and say, you're an investment for my security, a military mm -hmm. investment. Uh, the next one comes along and says, no, no, I'm coming to you as a humanitarian because I'm trying to prevent the worst effects of the drought and I have my rules of operating and this is what I will fund. Mm. And then come the development uh, organization and say, oh, we are here to help you implement the SDGs or you know, investment, build capacity. I think one of the lessons we have to learn is that nation building, particularly out of a period, and, and Somalia tragically is a very sustained period of conflict, crisis, and almost the implosion of federal government for, for a while, um, requires also the international community to take a step back and think about how it actually mm -hmm. engages. And this is, you know, in some ways true, and we discussed this morning in the, in the Africa session, also the, you know, the tragic evolution of South Sudan, which was just a few years ago a triumphant moment of Africa, of uh, the international community working together and giving birth to a new nation. And just a few years later, uh, it's turned into a nightmare, principally for the people of, of South Sudan, but also for those who 
you know, invested, had many hopes, and that's not just the international community in the sense of the West or, or further afar, but also the region, uh, which had heavily invested in a peace, uh, out, peaceful outcome in, in South Sudan. The reason I frame it in those terms is that um, in conceiving of a way forward, and a way forward that builds off a difficult um, legacy, but at the same time presents an enormously ambitious view of rebuilding a nation state in the true sense of the word of governance, of um, economic progress, of participation, uh, of civic society and civil society being able to play its part, and also an economy of, of entrepreneurship, which in the case of Somalia, in a sense, is a particularly interesting opportunity because Somalia is probably the one country that managed to establish a more functional cell phone infrastructure network 15 years ago than any other country on the continent, and I'm, mm. I'm sure perhaps in other parts of the world. Because um, I remember the famous story of having three, three providers in Somalia without the government, without the regulatory authority, mm -hmm. deploying the latest 3G or 2G technology at the time to create communications infrastructure. So business and entrepreneurship are, again, assets that are there. The danger that I think we, we face today, and it is not just in the you know, slight caricature of, of different funding channels, it's also that in looking at Somalia's development, you frame a development agenda. The international community is still caught between short-term stabilization, humanitarian interventions, and a largely security-justified mm. Um, approach to investing in, in, in the agenda of your government. And this is where I think we, we all have learned some, some very hard lessons that um, development is in its failure and in its absence, yes, very often the, the ground upon which very fertile seeds are sown for radicalization, for um, secession in the sense of nation states, but also for radicalism and for extremism, and, and then terrorism. And I, you know, I noted that you had the term terrorism here. There's a lot of st steps before terrorism <coughs> becomes the symptom that actually have a lot to do with development yeah. and the credibility of, of, a, of a government to, to deliver that development. We traced part of that also in a study that I think both of you are familiar with uh, called Journeys to Extremism mm -hmm. that UNDP published last year. And I have to say it's one of the more remarkable studies that I have read in, in years and, and also for a UN organization, an unusual format in which it captures really the perspective of young people who, who moved, as I often describe it, from being uh, sort of the center of attention of a 16-year-old in their family, the hope, so to speak, of the next generation, to becoming a terrorist in their community. How does that happen? Mm. Why does it happen? And, and I won't go into the details, but I, for those of you who may not be familiar with the report, that is already correcting the perspective. I end by just pointing out also that the international community, and I think also in the narrative, Prime Minister, that whether in Somalia, but also in, in other, let's say, points of tension in the region, we have to remind ourselves that the amount of money we spend when we begin to turn the developmental failure into a military and security-driven response strategy, which may sometimes be the only option that is left. I mean, Amisom's presence, I'm sure you would describe also as a big stepping stone in trying to create the conditions where government can re-emerge. But the fact is that our international response, whether it's in peacekeeping in military terms, is essentially unaffordable. Mm -hmm. And it has an opportunity cost because um, what it costs us to put soldiers on the ground in an international peacekeeping mission or indeed other military and security measures that are taken exceeds by a factor of 10 to 20 times that which we would actually need to invest to often make breakthrough solutions happen. Um, I don't want to use you know, imaginary figures here, but I, I would venture to say that if you looked at Afghanistan and the total cost of the engagement of the war against terrorism, but also all the efforts that went with the, with the security operators, I wonder whether you could have actually paid every single citizen in, in Afghanistan a kind of social security payment per right. month as a basic income. And you actually may have been far further along in stabilizing that nation than our very um, impulsive, because 
you know, terrorism is very threatening. And therefore also the reaction of the international community is not always economically the most rational. So just to say, strategic geography can mean many things. It is externally defined by self-interest. I think for the countries of the Horn, it is important to define that notion of strategic geography mm -hmm. in their own terms, and that will allow perhaps for a more mm -hmm. equitable approach. I haven't touched on issues that have also to do with a purely geographical phenomena, which is the kind of uh, conditions in terms of meteorology, weather patterns, rainfall, arid, dry lands, semi-arid lands, the vulnerability to climate change and environmental change in that region is also one that should make the world sit up and say even more of a reason why we should be there alongside with our partners. So just a few reflections to join the Prime Minister and, and uh, the discussion here. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much, uh, Akeem. We do have a few more slides, as I said, uh, wonderful pictures of, of refugee flows in both directions. But I know that a few of you have to leave relatively soon. I did want to open up the discussion now, and we can show the slides a little bit later. I'm going to point to you to immediately, because I know you have to leave. Thanks. If you'd introduce yourself as well, please. I'm Sara Pantuliano, I'm the Managing Director at the Overseas Development Institute, ODI, in London. Um, so, thank you so much for your remarks. Part of, well, a long part of my career has been spent in Sudan and South Sudan. Amongst other things, I was the, the observer for the Italian government at the Eagle Peace Process. So it's a, it's a journey that I have lived <laughs> intensely and deeply. And I think a lot of the lessons that we can take from South Sudan are very relevant for Somalia and other parts of the region today. Um, it's interesting, Akim, you were talking about the enthusiasm, you know, the, the um, effervescence that accompanied the creation of this new nation. For those of us who knew South Sudan really well, actually the feeling as the process went on, you know, from the CPA signing, the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement onward, was actually of fear and, and, and you know, very deep anxiety about the journey that this country was embarking on. And it was really hard to reconcile the narrative between the South Sudanese, the Sudanese, those who knew the country really well, and the international community writ large. They had a very different narrative. You know, I used to joke it. They were talking about the Switzerland of Africa, or a country that I just did not recognize, where a lot of the emphasis for those who understood and knew the country had to be on the security situation, on the deep tensions that needed to be addressed. Whereas what the international community was focusing on was throwing every bit of their toolkit you know, the, the, the toolbox at, to the South Sudanese without, without really understanding the, the, the issues, you know, the deep tensions, the deep cleavages between the South Sudanese in particular and not South Sudan versus Sudan and not the development issues. We thought that by, you know, importing um, all the, the, the toolkit from Afghanistan, the multi-donor trust fund, or you know, the, uh, the DDR process, all, all those technocratic solutions were gonna give us the answers. And this heavy investment in peace dividends and you know, all these, these sorts of socioeconomic outputs, they actually did not help South Sudan in the least. At the same time, all the investment in reconciliation in you know, dialogue at the community level, in bringing the political parties together, in you know, really focusing on the security side, was progressively going back. And it was interesting to see, we did a massive evaluation of all the support to conflict prevention and peace building to South Sudan in 2009. It was mandated by the OECD, it cost 800,000 euros. Not a single line was taken on board. And uh, actually there are a lot of lessons. There was a similar evaluation done in DRC because the more I read those evaluations, the more it makes me think about Somalia today and how much the people were saying, you know, focus on security, focus on justice, focus on reconciliation. Once this is, you know, once you help that, the economy, the investment, the business will come. It's not for you, you know, to try and build these services, to try and invest, you know, you don't do it very well. And in any case, what's the point of building a, you know, a hospital in Iraq if I can't travel from, you know, to, to, from back to Iraq because it's too unsafe, it's too violent, it's too, you know, um, uh, too dangerous. And I know that, you know, actually some lessons have been taken on board in Somalia. We see a different leadership from the government really trying very hard to say, listen to us. 
listen to our understanding of the country, listen to you know, the issues on the ground. But I also know because I work very closely with your team and with civil society leaders in Somalia, that there is huge frustration. That it's, a, it's a battle, it's a constant battle to get international partners to really take on board these lessons, to, to be meaningful, genuine partners in you know, researching. And, 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 and you, as you say, part of it is because of the frameworks we have, the, the things that hold back our ability to really you know, support a meaningful transition to peace um, without throwing you know, a projectized approach <laughs> at, uh, at the problem. I hope, you know, we, we have talked before about you know, this new approach, the sustaining peace umbrella that you have, which is really about elevating peace building beyond the projectized technocratic approach, but it's not being implemented on the ground. We, we need a quantum leap to, to to really reassure our Somali friends that we can be of help rather than hindrance. And I'm sorry I need to leave. Because <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the heart of my passion, this region. But, but yeah, sorry. But, but Thank you. To continue tomorrow morning. Thank you, sorry for being here. And thanks for the great work that ODI uh, does. I think we're having two really interesting discussions here. And I'm, I'm keen to li listen to other people in the audience. There's a, a discussion around Somalia specifically, and the Prime Minister has laid out, I think, some real opportunities, and we're discussing sequencing and how to attract investment and so on and so forth. And I think what Akeem and Sara did really is, I mean, launched a, a very constructive but critical discussion about development and about how the international system responds to countries like Somalia, the insider-outsider perspective, short-term versus long-term, the, the stovepiping of security and humanitarian uh, uh, and development, how to forge genuine partnerships. It seems that what we're trying to do in Somalia really is a, is a, is a testing ground for some of the, I think, strong ideas that you have, Akim, around this. Colleagues, other, other thoughts, other questions, other insights? Please. You've stayed past 7 o'clock, so you must have an interest in this area, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Please. Otherwise I'll just start pointing at people, I warn you. Well, Akeem, would you like, please? Yeah. It is, it is, it is. I think maybe both of us need to be in another session, but this is, ah, I, I don't think I could, I would be more uh, scared to say that I think in, in the next year or two, there is a critical moment that you have created for you. Ah, I'm sorry, you, they, they need the mic. Oh. Akim, I'm sorry, sorry. In the next year or two, there is a critical moment that you have created now with the new government and with the approach for the international community to, to change tack, and I think this is, your presence here in Davos, but also in New York and, and international discussions, the re-engagement of the international financial institutions also uh, with Somalia, I think those are the signals that will allow us to, to envisage a, a change in the terms with which the world you know, engages with Somalia and, and hopefully um, moves beyond a view of the horn as this um, you know, uh, threat narrative yes. that, that keeps on being uh, put forward. Thank you. As you heard, I think both of our panelists do need to go to another session, so I think we should give the final word to the Prime Minister. Again, Prime Minister, thank you for being here. Thank you for your honest and open assessment. I'm sorry we didn't have a, a large audience to have this discussion with you, but I know you have more opportunities both publicly and, I hope, privately during your stay in Davos to, to continue these discussions. But final words from you, uh, Prime Minister. No, uh, thank you. Um, 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 Khaled, you, you did mention that I haven't talked about uh, terrorism and, and, and countering terrorism. Uh, the concept for us as a government is, is, is different now. Uh, as I laid down, uh, there are three major strategic areas we work on. One is economic growth, economic recovery, tackling corruption, uh, investing in infrastructure, uh, financial mechanisms that work for the Somali people so that you create opportunity for investors inside and outside. And second is this process of inclusive politics and legislative agenda that works for now and, and future, and the third is security. Uh, and if you see this, you would understand that uh, you cannot do the other two without being in a position to finance it. Uh, so fighting terrorism means that providing good governance, provision of service to your people, giving your people hope, letting your people feel that they're part of their government, uh, create a uh, situation where everyone feels that they need to protect their system and their government. Uh, it means including the youth, the, uh, our women, uh, 
the religious leaders and everyone so that it is uh, fought on ideology, it's fought on good governance, it's fought on, on, on legitimacy. Uh, which in reality means that uh, if the thinking uh, is war on terror issue and military to military, uh, that is, a, I think, a, a strategy that hasn't worked. Yes. You need to bring people to a situation where they say that I am a stakeholder and I'm going to take part in defending my country and I see the potential and progress. You can only do that if they feel the government is a government that has a proper justice system that is working. If they feel the government is a government that is creating an opportunity for its people. And if they see the government is providing services, that it is building roads, hospitals, bridges, and uh, open doors for opportunity for its people. That is why I think, as, as a leader of my country, the President and I have came to the conclusion that our narrative should be that we need to re-engage with international financial institutions, but also seize the opportunity of the skills of our people. They have created the best businesses in the continent without functioning government. Imagine if we give them further opportunities. And finally, uh, Akim would understand uh, that the world has been investing in Somalia. And they need to ask questions that what returns have we gained so far? Of course, some, can we make that more efficient, more effective, less cost, and more benefit for the Somali people? And that is the argument we are putting forward. Thank you, Prime Minister. Colleagues, I'm sorry we're ending the session. We did start late. You have plenty of opportunities to see the Prime Minister and Akim Steiner later during uh, this Davos. I will just show you these slides since our colleagues from Prezi very kindly uh, prepared them for us. This is a slide on refugee flows, which I won't show, but as you leave the room, the one I'd like to show uh, is this one, which is, I think, a very nice slide, which shows refugee returns around the Horn of Africa. And I think this is a nice way to end what I think has been a very positive session indeed. So many thanks to all of you for your uh, time, and please join me in applauding the panelists. <laughs>